Good afternoon. My name is Brooks Fail from the class of 1988, and I have the honor of serving Williams as Executive Director of Alumni Relations. On behalf of all of us in Williamstown, I offer you a warm welcome home, and thank you for making the effort to be here this weekend to, to connect with classmates, friends, and your college. One of the many privileges of my job is to work closely with today's speakers and see firsthand their commitment and dedication to Williams. By way of introduction, let me say a little bit about each. Kate Ramsdell, class of 1997, is not only here celebrating her 25th reunion, <laughs> but is also our president of the Society of Alumni. It's a role she's held the past two years and will do so for another 24 hours when she will pass the baton to incoming President Brent Shea, class of 1978. <laughs> Professionally, Kate is an educator, having spent most of her career at Noble and Greeno School outside Boston, where she serves as Director of College Counseling, among many other duties. Kate's dedication to Williams is equaled by some but surpassed by none. She is motivated by a desire to keep fellow Eves connected to each other and their college. Kate is an open sounding board and positive advocate for all, and our alumni community has been the beneficiary of her efforts. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Kate. It is my pleasure to introduce the 18th president of Williams, Maud S. Mandel. <laughs> Maud's reputation as a leader in higher education precedes her current role. A graduate of Oberlin College and the University of Michigan, she built an exceptional legacy over two decades at Brown University, having served on the faculty starting in 2001 and later as dean of the college. During her Williams tenure, Maud has engaged our community in articulating a vision for the college's future through a strategic planning effort involving faculty, staff, students, alumni, family, and friends. She has advanced educational work at Williams from major grants to important conversations about the role of technology and the creative arts in a liberal arts education. In addition, she has encouraged a culture of shared community-wide responsibility for diversity, equity, and inclusion work and it continued Williams' investment in the sustainability of its built environment. Maud is also an accomplished historian whose scholarship looks at how politics and practices of inclusion and exclusion in 20th century France have affected Jews, Armenians, Armenians and Muslim North Africans, among other minorities. In addition to her presidential duties, Maud holds the title of Professor of History and teaches as her schedule allows. Please join me in welcoming President Maud S. Mandel. Before turning the stage over to Maud and Kate, we thought we'd offer a reminder of why we're all here. Just five days ago, we welcomed the class of 2022 to the alumni ranks. Here are some of the sights and sounds from this year's commencement. Let us lead by example and never forget how fortunate we are. Thank you. And above all, remember in hours of joy and darkness that Williams has taught you that the test of the ages is not whether you lead, 
the good life, but a good life. Godspeed. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome from, on behalf of the Society of Alumni. It's really nice to see a packed house and so many familiar faces. Um, we're here today for what I know, because anytime you talk to Maud, it is this way, a lively conversation um, and a good chance to allow anybody who's in the room to ask some questions at the end. Uh, it is so good to be here in Williamstown. And I feel like being in person and having the good fortune of making these connections and feeling one another's hugs has been some of the best parts of the last 24 hours that I've been in town. Um, and then just all of the learning, all of the connection, um, the chances to engage with everything that's been happening on campus. And some of us were here, whether that's 30 years, 50 years, 70 years. Um, and we've all been tucked away in our own corners of the world, but here we are. Last year, Maude and I had a chance to do this, but it was virtual. And like so many things over the last few years, just coming back and sitting on stage together um, somehow makes it feel different. It's an incredible honor, so thank you, Maude. And I would say, and now you've seen some of it, commencement last week really set the tone for me for reunion. It was so forward-looking. Um, and so many of the themes that emerged, they were tenderness and reflection, kindness and community. Um, and as I left this place, I could really feel that with that class of 22, though I will say I'm not sure they've yet proven that they're the greatest class ever to have graduated, um, you know, they've, they've been through a lot. And though we can sometimes experience Williams as a bubble, I know that the last couple of years for that class in particular were somewhat difficult. Um, but because of the ways that those themes emerged, I left really feeling as though we are all going to be okay. And today's format is, is more or less straightforward. Maud and I will have a conversation here on stage for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have the chance to open it up to you. Um, and like any good Williams class, sometimes that's the best part. So I, I hope that that will remain true today. Um, so Maud, Maud, I, some, many of you know this, but Maud arrived four years ago with this year's graduating senior class. So when she got here in the fall of 2018, um, she was the equivalent of a first year student in her presidency. Um, and, and her last four years have been marked by, you know, quite a bit of upheaval. And I feel very lucky to have witnessed her extremely steady, consistent, principled, thoughtful leadership over those four years. Um, and, and they were marked by resilience, I think, not only for the students, but also the faculty and staff, um, and a lot of innovation and light. And so, as you think through the last four years and hold all of those sort of competing truths together, um, how would you characterize them for yourself and for the Williams community? Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone uh, for being here today and for, for coming back to Williamstown and, and to the campus. It's really wonderful to see all of you. Um, it, it's true that um, when I think of uh, the class of 2022, they may or may not be the best class, <laughs> but uh, they are my class. We came in together, um, and, and I, I like to joke that I, I was a senior this year, that I went through all the years. And so when we were planning this year's uh, baccalaureate and my charge to the class, I was really thinking about um, that very question that you just posed. and. Um, sort of what had characterized the arc of this experience for me and for them. And I, I really was thinking of it in terms of years. So for example, um, the first year, when we were first year students, the jitters that come with newness. And um, speaking for myself, uh, sitting in this audience in my first year, you know, I was pretty nervous <laughs> and kind of green, right? And, the, and, I, and I actually think when I think about their experience when they come to school, what needs to happen in that first year in order to feel um, 
successful and uh, engaged and um, like uh, it's all going to work out. There's a lot of nervousness in that first year. Then the second year, our second year, my second year, really characterized by um, the kind of challenges and uh, competencies and competence. We expect sophomores, we expect, expect second year students to be able to make some decisions, to guide themselves their way through, and, and they were doing that very well. And then suddenly, in March of 2020, in their sophomore year, uh, home they all went. Um, home we all went. My home was close. I didn't have very far to go. Um, I used to joke I could see my office from my office, so I would sit in my home office zooming and looking at my work office across the way. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that required such, um, it, was so, it was such a dramatic rupture. It was such an incredible moment of rupture for this campus, for all of us, for the faculty, for the students, for the staff, uh, but particularly for the students who were here uh, on, a, on a path that was predictable um, and then suddenly wasn't. And then in their third year, um, in our third year, all, we all came back, but it was to such a strange experience. We, and you know, it, it's, I think, um, hard for anyone who spent a sort of typical, whatever a typical year is, a typical year here to imagine what that year was like. It wasn't necessarily a bad year. It was just incredibly different. People lived uh, masked, of course, um, but in pod communities with a small group of people. There was no athletics. There were no a cappella singing groups. Uh, people took food um, out of, it was grab and go food. Only 50% of classes were in person. The other 50% were remote. Uh, so it was um, a quieter year in a lot of ways. It was a year that I think not all students would say was terrible except in retrospect, but while they were going through it, Many were just so happy to be here that actually there was a lot of community um, resiliency and engagement um, that, that marked that experience. Of course, for incoming students at the time, it was the only thing they knew of Williams, and that was a, a, a strange and it will have some, I think, longer-term consequences. Uh, and then this year, which um, I must say, I think, is actually something my son, who recently graduated from another institution, said about the class of 2022 that I think was also really notable uh, here, which is they, they were the class that understood what they had lost, and then they came back. And so the joy and the gratitude, the words you were saying that marked this commencement, the tenderness, the care, the sense of community, um, it was it was pretty powerful. It was palpable at that graduation, I think. Um, and you you see it most. I wanted to call your attention for those of you who haven't heard this story to the part in the video. There was a shot of this uh, balcony at Stetson, um, which overlooks uh, where we were holding the commencement. And why there is a shot of people there, all in masks, is those were students who had tested positive for COVID. Unexpectedly, we aren't doing formal testing right now, but they tested and contacted us and said, we have COVID, what should we do? Um, and we were a little stumped, actually. <laughs> we, hadn't really, we didn't really have a plan for that. And, um, and really, it came together very quickly that we were able to figure out a way, actually thanks to a really good idea of one of them, um, to open up that balcony, figure out how to, to have them be part of it. And it was a real highlight of the, of the ceremony that we were able to figure out a way to include, um, oddly, a, a highlight of the ceremony to figure out a way to include this COVID experience, which really did mark their experience in this very um, creative and um, sort of operationally challenging, but ultimately successful last minute experiment that worked out that way. And I, I'm using those words and saying it that way because that characterized their entire experience here. The whole thing was like that. And so to have that moment at the end was, was really noteworthy. I actually said to Maude, I thought some of those students might not have COVID and thought, ooh, if I could graduate from Stetson Balcony with all my friends, that would be amazing. Um, and how would we know? Uh, and so, you know, as this class is moving on, you are staying, and we're lucky that you are not graduating. Master's program. Yes, exactly. Um, and so I think one of the most remarkable things is, and even having worked in a school through 
you know, planning for the pandemic and figuring out how that school was going to run, um, Maud and her team and, and dozens, probably more people were working on the strategic plan for Williams and that work did not stop. Um, and so doing these two things concurrently is really quite remarkable. And so you've been great about keeping us updated about what's happening at every phase of that process. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk about where we are, what's on the horizon. Am I willing to talk about strategic planning? <laughs> With a captive audience. <laughs> the captive audience, right. Um, yes, I am willing. Um, so the, uh, actually, joking aside, well, it was really important to me, as soon as we got through the very, very worst of trying to figure out how to navigate the difficult moments of um, mid-2020 and into the fall of 2020, it was very important to me to, to continue and complete the process of strategic planning, even though it was rel very different than we had imagined it. And that was because, to me, what a strategic plan is, it sounds um, very non-academic and very corporate, but what it what it really means for me is a vision for the future. And it, so it was a way, in a moment of crisis, for us to continue to think about what we do here and what we're going to do, and the optimism that comes from planning for a future, even when you're dealing with a very difficult present. Uh, uh, and so it was uh, important to keep that going and even to, as soon as possible, get back into, in fact, forwarding some of the key initiatives that we were moving forward. Um, and uh, there are a few uh, worth noting here. Um, we. Uh, so at the core of this strategic plan is really, there are really two um, points I'd want to stress. The first is that it is really geared to thinking about what Williams has done brilliantly and must continue to do brilliantly into the future in, in, in ever-changing contexts. And that really is the um, powerful learning that comes on this campus, primarily um, in small classes and in that faculty-student connection that um, often takes place in the hands-on learning experience in laboratories and classrooms and where students and faculty can connect um, in, an, in the intimacy of intellectual engagement that this campus offers so powerfully. Uh, and so I, um, we have in many ways uh, focused very heavily on thinking about how we continue to offer that extraordinary learning experience by increasing research opportunities, um, deepening the tutorial experiencing, offering a more experiential learning opportunities, more of those moments where students can take their learning from the classroom out into the real world circumstances uh, and um, try out some of the theories they're learning in the classroom in real world uh, encounters with the guiding hand of a faculty person uh, working alongside them or, or a highly experienced staff person who is an expert in a particular arena. Um, and that, uh, has, that is really one side of the strategic plan, while the other side is really focused on what are the key challenges of the moment in which we're living in that this generation of graduates really need to be expert in talking across difference, um, you know, increased and ever uh, uh, growing global uh, ability to talk in sort of a global context, uh, technologically savvy in a world that is rich with data um, and, uh, and technology in ways that, you know, I can barely keep up with, right? This, this generation has a different kind of relationship um, to, uh, to the world of technology. Um, Obviously, uh, the the climate crisis and the ways in which um, an um, an sort of ability to understand and talk about the environment and to build in solutions into any um, work op, uh, at space that they are going to go into. Uh, all of these are really crucial to current undergraduates. And so our strategic plan is really also focused on that. And there are some key initiatives we've been moving forward to help in those arenas as well. So we have. Um, for example, uh, a, a major investment in our um, uh, Davis Center, which is our multicultural center, which is the space on campus where we really focus on talking across difference um, and supporting um, all the different kinds of people that come to Williams uh, when they're here, historically underrepresented students, first generation college students. Um, uh, we, we were talking in the last panel about um, all of the diversity that makes up this community. 
uh, and how we support uh, all of those uh, many different kinds of people to be successful here when they're on campus and to engage with each other across difference. And the Davis Center is the place where a lot of that work happens and then where students learn those competencies and take them with them into the next uh, phase of their lives. And that's a really important commitment and we are uh, breaking ground on that project uh, very, very soon. Um, and we're very grateful to the support of many, many alumni who have helped us uh, move that project forward. Um, in addition uh, to that work, we are moving forward with a um, major investment in the arts at Williams. And I just, before I, some of you have heard and know that we're part of that process is we're going to um, move the Williams College Art Museum from its current location to a new building that we're going to be constructing where the old Williams Inn used to be. Um, and that's the kind of uh, physical um, manifestation of this investment in the arts. But it's worth noting that the arts at Williams is one of the major um, strengths of this institution uh, and has been over a long time. And it really, I think, comes from a deep understanding that to be educated, um, fully educated liberal arts students, we want our students to be able not only to be the experts in the particular area in which they have mastered a skill set, but we want them to have a broad sense of the humanistic traditions that they've inherited. And art history here is one of the places where that has really famously been done well. For those of you who are able to come to the morning panel, the celebration of some of the uh, faculty who have left an imprint on many of you here, I know you don't need to hear from me what the impact of, uh, of some of those courses were on you and uh, and your um, lifelong development. So our investment in the arts is building on that tradition and is really um, a focus on the fact that so many of our faculty use the collections in our art museum to teach. So the museum for us is a teaching space um, and it is a place where we can really double down on our commitments to the humanities and the ways in which it intersects with a variety of other fields. So we have faculty in biology or environmental studies, in history, in dance, uh, and certainly in art history who use the collections of the Wickham Museum in their courses. So for us, the museum is the um, arts equivalent to having um, a science building. It is the place where our, our faculty who engage with the arts can teach using those hands-on artifacts uh, in their courses that um, is that side of the shops, if you will, um, experiential learning. Uh, and, and so we have a significant um, investment in that space going well. Um, so we're continuing uh, to move those initiatives forwards. Longer term, you'll, you've probably heard and seen uh, a focus on the broader um, uh, campus in general and thinking uh, over long term about um, uh, athletics and other kinds of spaces that um, will will need attention as we go forward. Um, but this, I've said many times, is a, is a multi-year plan and uh, we're, I hope, uh, only in the early phases of what I see as a, a really a 10 to 15 year plan. Thank you. Um, you know, Williams, I think, is has established a reputation as being a place that takes care of people um, and I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for people in this room, but I can say for myself and for people I've talked to that really almost nothing has made me prouder of this institution in the last 25 years than the recent announcement um, towards the end of April that we were going to become an all-grant institution when it, became, when it came to financial aid. Uh, thank you. And certainly, you know, well known, but bears noting again, the first in this country. Uh, and, and when you lead the way, you want to do it in the right ways. And so this seems like the, a great way to do that. So, you know, as we think about what true affordability means, you know, how do you see it and how will it shape Williams into the future? Thank you so much for asking about that particular initiative. So. Um, the True Affordability Initiative really grew out of the work of a lot of people in the Office of Financial Aid and Admissions, um, as well as in the Provost's Office and, uh, and throughout the senior leadership team and the Board of Trustees, to think about how to build on Williams' tremendous leadership in the field of financial aid. So I, one of the things that attracted me to Williams was, in fact, its long-term commitment to access and affordability. And it has been uh, doing this work for a long time. It's, um, it is, has always been a leader in this space. Uh, but one of the first questions we asked was, what's next? What, what do we need to do next in order to really meet um, students where they are and move them 
um, uh, to be able to take full advantage of everything this institution has to offer. And it was really through conversations that the financial aid office had with students where we started to um, recognize that, and there was some really good scholarship on this too, that even with all of the tremendous financial aid that Williams offered, there were lots of hidden costs in a Williams education embedded, sort of structurally invisible initially, and then oddly really visible which I'll explain in a minute, and, and, yet, um, and yet sort of unseen over time. Um, so those hidden costs, William started to, it, as, it, as we started to think through true affordability, William started to work away at some of these, like um, the full book grant that many of you have heard of, or covering health insurance costs for students, or, or ensuring that they had money to take trips home every year to see their family. These were some of the hidden costs that our full, our full paying students were able to just do, right? Like just go home and see their family, and those students who were on financial aid weren't able to do. So we were increasingly committed to this idea of how to remove some of those um, uh, hidden costs uh, and to make it more possible for uh, a wide variety of students to take full advantage uh, of the experience. And what became increasingly clear were two things that this uh, initiative were really seeking to target. The first uh, is that middle income students, but which is our high need students had very, very, um, uh, generous financial aid and some of these uh, true affordability initiatives were really targeted to them. But we were finding that the, what we'd call the low middle or the middle middle income students, that there were people who uh, wouldn't come to Williams um, because either uh, the, uh, the, that some of, that's, that some of the financial aid that other students had was not available to them or not at the same level. And so, for example, they had uh, loans in their package, or they had loans in their package um, when they took out financial aid. Um, uh, because every student on financial aid has three components of their financial aid. A grant from the school, a loan, a series of loans, uh, and then a work study component. So the middle income students had both the work study and the grant, and they were at, at the grant, the work study, and the um, uh, and the loans in their packages, and they were larger and causing real stress on those families. The other thing that was just becoming increasingly clear is that the the built-in assumption that students should work. For, to pay for their education, which honestly was an unexam is an unexamined assumption across higher education at this point, um, was a built-in structural inequality and inequity uh, between our students, students who had to work to pay for their education and people who did not. Now, don't misunderstand. A huge percentage of our students have paying jobs while they're on campus. 40% of them are not on financial aid. Many people work, and they should work, and they learn something from working, and they need the resources. That's why they work. That's why, presumably, you work, is the, is the need for resources. Many people work, and, and our students on financial aid uh, worked, and our students not on financial aid worked. I'm, I'm sure many of you worked in college. Uh, I certainly did. Um, but what was marking the difference between students is we had a whole group of students, a very large percentage of our student body who that was on financial aid that were required to work to be here, in order to be here for Williams. And that's really what this initiative has uh, removed. It, it, it has said, if you wanna work, by all means work. If you want to take an unpaid internship with, uh, it, it, so we have support for that for the college too, do that. If you want to do a language study if you, uh, in your summer, do that. You, if you want to take that extra course or do, frankly, sleep more, whatever it is you want to do, that's up to you. And if what, if what you want to do is have a job, that's fine. Um, but that, that, and so it really was targeted at removing that, um, structural difference uh, among two groups of students and to open up opportunity across the um, the student body so it, it and it's been uh, very well received on this campus um, it's been uh, well received, I hear now, sort of, off campus, <laughs> which is to say other schools um, who are starting to grapple with this, and that's exactly what we wanted, which is to also launch a conversation outside of Williams about some of uh, the blocks to affordability um, and uh, that will encourage uh, high-need students to continue to come, but also that middle-income bracket um, who was finding it difficult to choose to come to places like Williams. 
Um, something that you said at the end is a nice segue to our next topic, which is this idea of things like structural inequities or other things, and then you also mentioned sleep, right? Like, there are parts of students' lives on campus that enhance their well-being, and there are parts of campus life that detract from their well-being, and Williams is investing a lot in making sure that students are well and they're healthy um, in all ways. And so, you know, I, I think sometimes the word wellness gets boiled down to a very simple idea of just sort of like deep breathing or yoga or, you know, whatever it is, but it's a very complex thing for adolescents and certainly for all of us as we enter our adult lives. Um, so thinking about Williams is a place where people find purpose, a sense of belonging, um, where they nurture their mind, their spirit in their body. Um, how is Williams thinking about student well-being and what are some of the things you're doing to make sure that our students are well? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. It's really top of mind right now. There's, uh, uh, and for anybody who follows the news, you know there's a crisis in um, mental health uh, among young adults across the country. It doesn't actually date to the pandemic, although it's intensified in the last few years. It, it really dates, if you look at the data, um, back to 2014, 2015, where uh, students started to articulate a greater, a greater um, sense of uh, a lack of well-being and that the data around that has really um, spiked, uh, particularly in the last couple of years. And we definitely feel it here too. Um, we hear from students. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that Williams uh, has a very uh, sophisticated and um, significant uh, infrastructure in place to support students when um, there is a mental health challenge. So we have a large number of um, therapists here that are available to students. We also have all kinds of other people, chaplains and deans and um, uh, staff that work in the, the Davis Center and all kinds of other uh, parts of the campus to support students in different ways. So that's one way Williams does this. But um, also as part of the strategic planning exercise, we've been beginning to move forward uh, a focus on an integrative well-being framework for the campus. Because um, in addition to providing therapy uh, and support when a student's in crisis, what we're really intently interested in and thinking about is uh, how do we empower people um, to have the internal fortitude to know how to deal with crisis crisis or even just malaise and anxiety uh, when it emerges. And, it's, uh, and um, a lot of this work is thinking about how do we build this into the residential life program? How do we build this into the athletic fields? How do we build this into uh, community uh, cultural work and student organizational life over time? So uh, we are going to continue to um, do the work on planning in this area so that uh, over the next couple of years we can launch uh, initiatives that will support well-being broadly defined um, and not just um, focus narrowly on mental health, although we will continue, I hope, to provide the very best resources possible in that space as well. So there is a part of the strategic plan that speaks specifically to us, to all of you in the room, to alumni, and I like to think that makes us somewhat unique, but um, I also just like the way that the college framed it, so I'm gonna read a brief excerpt. Since the formation in 1821 of what is apparently the oldest alumni association in the country, Williams alumni have become justly famous for their devotion to the college. Their loyalty is also the secret ingredient that helps Williams excel as the country's greatest residential liberal arts college and one of its great institutions of higher learning. Um, so if you are not already feeling good about Williams, I hope you feel really good right now. Uh, but in, in all seriousness, I think it's somewhat unusual for a college to include alumni in its own strategic plan. Um, and so I'd like to know more about it. Why are we reflected in it? Uh, and what is it that you're envisioning that, you know, how are we gonna help the college evolve and then how will the college help all of us evolve over a lifetime? So I have to say, I always say that that's distinctive about our strategic plan, but I've never actually really looked at a lot, <laughs> very specifically, so I, I should be careful. But I, I, I should say that the inclusion, the specific inclusion of a section on alumni in the strategic plan came from you. And what I mean by that is when I got here and launched this exercise around thinking about the college's future, I heard from dozens of Williams alumni asking me, how can we help? You know, what's our role? Can you put me on a committee? Um, and and you know, help us help you, right? Help. It was it was really a um, and 
and at first, it, I, honestly, I was scratching my head a little bit. I was like, huh, I was really thinking of a strategic plan for the campus, right? Like I was focused on undergraduates. It seemed like the right thing. And it, and it was over the course of those conversations um, where I realized that two things that were really important. The first is um, that this college would not be what it is without the alumni. You have um, been such a tremendous resource for this institution. And I, 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 I mean that in the obvious philanthropic ways, of course. We have resources available to us that are the envy of our peers, thanks to generations of philanthropic commitment by our alumni. So of course I mean that. But I actually don't only mean that. I mean um, providing internships for undergraduates, coming back to campus and teaching in winter study, auditing classes, moving back to town and auditing classes and just being partners in the classroom with our students asking me at every single event, and now somebody has to ask this, what can we do to help? But I'm gonna, I'll pre-answer the question, so I'll get you, I'll <laughs> get you off the hook. Um, but uh, it, it, is, it has really been a gift to me. It is the secret sauce of this place. And so as we continue to move forward this, with thinking about the strategic plan, the, one of the things I kept thinking about is, well, we can't take that for granted. That's an amazing gift that, the, that um, a history of commitment to this institution has created. But in fact, we have to be strategic about that. We can't just assume that the past will be true in the present. And so we need to really invest in our alumni and what makes them so special. And so it was really out of that recognition uh, that, um, that uh, we moved to being very careful to articulate strategic goals for the college's relationship with its uh, alumni population as well. Um, and there are some really key components of that, but I'll just, and you're always welcome to read the strategic plan if you would like to see. It's on the, on, uh, it's on the web, of course. Um, but there's some key elements to it that I would note. The first is really um, continuing to build direct and concrete um, connections uh, between alumni and uh, our current students on campus and actually between and among alumni as well. And we have um, in particular a platform. We do that through eFlink. It's one way we do that. Uh, and if you're not already registered on eFlink, I would really encourage you to do it. It is a way that other alumni can find you, but students can find you. And it's not, sometimes I think people, you've heard, some of you've heard me say sometimes people are reluctant to um, sign up for eFlink because they think, well, I don't have a job for a student, so I'm not going to that's what they want to use this for. Um, but actually, eFlink is, um, sure, some students will be happy to find a job if you have one uh, to post and to talk about. But um, they really use it for mentoring. They use it to find examples of uh, people working in fields that they're interested in breaking into, um, and they don't know anything about that field. Uh, and they find uh, alumni who they can um, uh, contact and ask questions. There are affinity connections. We saw, we heard in the last panel around first generation college students. There's ways to find other people, uh, mentors from your own group or background who can help you connect or just even think through some of the basic things you need to know in order to be successful uh, in the next phase or in a future phase of life. Uh, and so that's a really important way um, that we are really investing in uh, continuing to um, strengthen one of the strengths of this college. Um, and then uh, the other is really continuing to think about our, our alumni's lifelong learning. We, we always say that a college, uh, a liberal arts education, is about an investment in lifelong learning. And we hope that one of the things you took with you when you left here is an ability to, uh, not only an ability, but a passion for learning, um, that you would continue to expand your own horizons, whatever you did, wherever you went, drawing, uh, drawing both on the capacities that that you learned here and recognizing from what you learned here how much you still had to learn. That is, I think, one of the great things we learn in college um, when, when you have a great education um, is really how much you still have to learn. So part of the uh, commitment in the strategic plan is to continuing to think about um, pre creating pathways and ways for alumni to invest in their own lifelong learning as well. And that is uh, an ongoing part of our, our conversations in this space. Thank you. Um, and just one more question before we open it up. Uh, summer is beginning, but I'm going to fast forward to September and just ask you. Don't race away I my know, summer. I know, we need a break. Um, but what are you most excited about for the coming school year? Thank you. Um, 
so I am a little excited about summer. But <laughs> And actually, we have a lot of celebrations here this summer, I should say. We have um, more reunions than you could possibly imagine, um, because we're doing a lot of important makeup reunions over the summer for people who got cheated of this wonderful experience, including uh, the class of 2020. And I'll just share here for those of you who haven't heard it. They're coming back. Uh, we polled them and asked um, how they'd like to use their time back on campus. And I very much assumed that the answer would be a kind of mini reunion early for the class of 2020. Um, and they do want that. We are going to have part, a party for them and, and celebrations. But actually, what they wanted, which really surprised me, but it shouldn't have, uh, they wanted to walk across the stage and get have me hand them a certificate. They want <laughs> robes and speeches and procession. Right. So they're coming back. I'm really looking forward to that. And, uh, and we're going to do the whole thing, although it's going to be July, so it's going to be really hot in that robe. But just feel bad for me when you see me up there in the, in the photographs afterwards. Um, and, uh, and, um, we're, and you can understand why um, that was so important, right? That lost ritual, that moment of closure, even though they graduated online, it was deflating. Uh, but also, we have heard uh, that 90% of them are planning to come. That's the, yeah, that's the pre-reg, so, yeah. <laughs> Really quite moving. And many are bringing families and the, you know, we're doing the whole thing. So we're doing a lot of celebrations here this summer, which would be fun. Um, in the fall, uh, what I'm most looking forward to is teaching again. So uh, some of you know that I taught a class here in a tutorial in the fall of 2019 with the expectation I would teach um, I think at the time I was thinking every other fall, uh, I can't teach easily in the spring because I travel so much for Williams more in the spring than in the fall. Um, but then when the pandemic hit, I was afraid to overcommit for the period um, right in ahead, uh, given I learned that I, my time was <laughs> highly, highly divided for a while. Um, but things, things have settled enough, so I'm planning to teach a research seminar uh, in the fall um, for uh, juniors and seniors. This one's not a tutorial. I'm experimenting with different forms just so I can... Uh, uh, approach students in different ways here. But I'm really excited to do that again because um, it is really engaging with students in the uh, exercise of their educational journey that is, the, that's the core mission of the institution. Um, and if, uh, I, without doing that regularly, I really um, lose sight of the, the true beauty of what happens in those encounters that was so clearly described in that earlier panel this morning, um, and uh, and I and I miss it when I don't do it. So um, and and the last of my tutorial students just graduated in 2022. So I need a new I need a new bunch. So uh, looking forward to that. That's right. We we might audit. Would that be okay? Um, so now we'll we're we're opening up to questions from you. And so if you have a question, and they should be questions. Um, please give your name, <laughs> offer your name and your class year, and then and share uh, what you have. And I don't know if we have somebody coming around, but go ahead. Tony Smith, class of 57. I'm thrilled by the uh, cancellation of the loan system and the mandatory work. Could you talk a little bit about the impact on the finances of the college? How is it being? Okay, I, and I'll just repeat the questions in case uh, folks can't hear. Uh, so the question was, um, what is the impact of the new um, full grant initiative on the college finances? Um, and you know, interestingly, this is one of the things I found so fascinating about this. So it's, an, it's a commitment, right? It's a, it's, um, uh, a little over $7 million a year in order to uh, invest in this. And we did it because we knew that um, uh, we did it actually, again, thanks to you. The, the support of alumni over many years uh, in the past uh, and in the present, uh, I think, gives us faith also going into the future that there is significant support uh, for continuing to grow financial aid at Williams. And so um, it was you know, really that, um, uh, I would say, confidence that allowed us to move forward. But I should note that's a small percentage of the college budget, actually. And it was one of the interesting, um, it's expensive, it's a real investment, and it's important. Um, but it was also an important recognition, and this goes back to my point about ask, sort of encouraging other institutions of higher ed to go in this direction, that um, it's affordable. Colleges can do this. Um, some universities, you know, uni for universities, the focus on research takes a different kind of financial commitment. Um, but colleges can do this, the ones that are well endowed, and they should. So um, 
I think it is a it is truly affordable to be truly affordable if they want to do it. Rick Ackerley, class of 67. Um, I'm interested in, in what you've learned or what your current thoughts are about the rise of anxiety, depression, and suicide. Um, and we've always known that, uh, that kids go schizophrenic in 19 and 20. I mean, there's a tendency for it. But, but, but you've learned a lot in the last few years, and I'd like to know. Thank you. So the question is, uh, what have we learned about uh, student uh, mental health crisis, depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation um, as a result of uh, the last many years of watching uh, the growth and pressure on this? Um, and uh, I would say, well, we've learned. I think we're we are we have learned and are learning quite a lot, um, which doesn't mean that um, we yet entirely know how to how to fully address the problems, although as I've mentioned uh, here, our focus is going to be very much on wellness writ large. But I think there are a couple of things we're learning. The first is that um, there is really, a, when, when we talk about the mental health crisis in uh, students, the, the phrase mental health crisis is actually conflating a lot of things that are somewhat different from each other. Everything from um, what one might call low-level anxiety about failing a class to actual, some of the things you talked about, depression, um, uh, suicidal ideation, and, th and that's a real range, and that actually trying to treat everything in the same way um, when it's really sweeping through a generation is not necessarily the right approach. So it's, that's part of, that's been one of, uh, I think, the learnings. Another, I think, that has been noteworthy um, is the way in which um, this is crossing um, identities, if you will. Uh, we're seeing the way in which a generation is affected, um, and uh, and it's noteworthy, for example, at a school like Williams, where we have a lot of students that do come from well-resourced backgrounds and lots of support systems, that it's, while there, while it is, um, there are disproportionately um, larger numbers uh, of students that struggle um, coming from the populations that um, often struggle with other kinds of uh, inequities in our society. Nevertheless, this is a, a, a sort of a shared, also generational um, reality that has been taking place, and that's um, noteworthy as well. And here in schools like Williams, one of the things that we really focus on, is, you know, when we think about why this is happening, is the kinds of pressures that the students who come here already brought with them. Um, and this might be to a third point, which is, uh, you know, it's really hard to get into Williams now. Um, you know, we have a, an 8% acceptance rate this year. Our admissions rates um, over the last couple of years have just continued and continued to, um, to, to show those kinds of uh, numbers. And, um, and so th the students who get here, no matter where they came from and what their background, have worked really hard to get here, and they're not very good at... Um, letting go of that internalized drive and pressure. Uh, and so I think one of the parts of the wellness exercise we're engaged in is also thinking about that when I said talking about resilience and talking about, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to sort of retreat to yoga and 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 um, and meditation as the as Williams answer, but there is a way in which, you know, messaging to these students that it's actually okay. You know to uh, and you know don't laugh, but to get a B, like <laughs> I don't know how many of you got lower than a B at some point in your college career. I did, right? And like, look, here I am, right? <laughs> so, so there are there just you know continuing to really address um, the fears and concerns that shape some of that the uh, anxiety uh, as it is emerging as well. So we're continuing to think about that, but it is it's a challenging conundrum because if it was just a Williams problem. Um, a Williams-based solution, um, you know, I might be very optimistic would work, but when it's a societal and generational problem, um, there are, of course, forces and structures in the wider society that are having an impact that um, it's harder to influence the outcome. And so uh, that's, that, you know, we have to be realistic about that as we simultaneously work very hard to make, um, uh, a, have a real impact. Yes, right back there. Class of ten, class of fifty-two. Um, are there any prospects of examining the 
recruitment of athletics, which puts a different emphasis on the general recruitment. And, and I just want to make sure I heard your question. Are you asking, are there plans to change the way we recruit athletes? Was that the question? Ah, uh, the emphasis. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, you know, Williams is 40% uh, varsity athletes. That is a big part of our culture. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a um, long tradition here of scholar athletes uh, that brings together a mix of students from athletics backgrounds and uh, non-athletic backgrounds to um, participate in a broader culture of learning here. And, and just before I get specifically to the question about recruitment, I just wanted to add to the topic of wellness. I really think there is a focus uh, on this campus when we are at our best of thinking about the way in which the brain functions better when the body is functioning well and the body uh, functions, uh, it, or is, it is good for society if both are working in tandem and together. Um, that's not just about athletics, that's about hiking Mount Greylock, right? That's about uh, 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 taking care of um, oneself by just engaging in the outside world uh, as well as um, hunkering down in the inside world when necessary. Um, and athletics, both the varsity sort and the club sort, are a big part of, the, of that story here at Williams. Um, and so I don't see a long-term diminishment of um, the role that uh, that scholar-athlete reality has played here on the campus. Um, however, there has been a lot of attention uh, over the last few years as part of the wider commitment to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility to think about um, the ways in which we uh, we recruit more generally and how we continue to think about um, bringing the commitments, uh, those commitments uh, throughout our athletic teams as well as our uh, other kinds of recruitment programs. And so I think that will, you'll see continued focus on that um, in the years ahead. Is there a possibility of eliminating the Again, I'm, I had a little trouble. Um, there is a difference in the way they're treated, for sure. Um, we have built some greater support for club sports even this year. Again, if you and I think, and again, I think you'll see more of that going forward, precisely because um, of the wellness initiative and the sense in which uh, walk on and you know. So this year, for example, our rugby team and and particularly our ultimate frisbee team was pretty triumphant, uh, out, out, right out in out in uh, out in the world, um, al al although lost in the finals to my alma mater. So I, I had a struggle there <laughs> that, that day as I was actually getting texts from uh, Ob Oberlin student, uh, former Ober Oberlin alumni who know, who uh, were friends of mine and on the ultimate team sending little uh, razzing texts to me that day. Um, but uh, it, it is, um, uh, I think, a number of our students participate in those kinds of activities, um, and that is a very important part of their college experience and uh, needs continual support and resources from the college, which we've been growing. So that will, I think, continue. Again, you'll see, I think, continued focus in that space. Yes, right here. Class of 2017, this is Misha, I guess, first. Uh, I just want to say I really greatly admire the work of grant based uh, uh, financial aid. And I was, I just wanted to ask you more about where you see that going in the future. So I don't want to move the goalposts, but I'm just curious. One of the things I really admire about the way you handle this is you're opening new app. Like, think, we think about the model of how uh, colleges should support their students. I'm wondering if you're viewing this change as kind of a pilot program into other changes. If the Victor, I'm thinking about maybe NYU Medical's change to drop all tuition for students, and then they saw a huge increase in their, you know, prestigiousness and ranking. I'm just curious if you think of this as like a a stepping stone to other things, or if this is just? Um, I appreciate the question. Um, I, so, oh, sorry, I didn't repeat it. The, sorry. Uh, uh, the question was if I saw the need-based financial aid uh, decision as a stepping stone to other larger decisions, and uh, the example you used was of uh, NYU and its decision to drop tuition from its medical student programs. So the question of tuition is an interesting one, um, and uh, I would say not on the horizon right now, but I, I also I want to be careful just to say that in a, it, I would say both yes and no, which is that I see, I, we saw this um, investment um, as a really important next step, and so it's always important to say 
what comes next, right? We're always thinking about how we can make this place more accessible. Uh, but it's not like I'm sitting on an idea right now that I plan to announce next year <laughs> that's going to be as monumental as that one. Um, I think I think there are uh, really smart people here at Williams that are consistently thinking about what are the things that we need to do to continue to make this place um, uh, what, what are the most powerful investments we can make that will really make a difference? Um, and uh, so, so that's a, a sort of vague answer, which is a, a sort of both end, right? Yes, this was really important in and of itself, and we want to pause and celebrate how significant a step this is. Uh, but we also will always be continuing to think about um, how we can continue that journey. The, there was a metaphor used in the last uh, panel uh, that I already set up from up here about um, being the next leg in the relay race. So this was an important leg in our relay race um, and continuing to broaden that access and affordability. Uh, and we'll continue to think about what comes next. I see somebody in the balcony. So go, go ahead. This is our last question. I love all the things you're saying. Could you say a bit more about how the don't mark the other class in 67? Uh, the strategic plan and how it addresses climate change. Oh. Yes, thank you for the question. The question was, how does the strategic plan uh, address climate change? So. Um, the strategic plan had two key pillars that were really, that it winds through the whole plan. One was around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and, and uh, accessibility, and the other was around sustainability. The sustainability um, part of the plan is focused on a few key areas. First and foremost, always education. That is to say, education and research, I should say. That is, how do we educate the next generation of Williams alum, no matter what they're going to go do, uh, to be um, movers on um, environmental justice, on sustainable living, uh, wherever they go and whatever they're doing. And so um, strengthening our environmental studies program, making sure that the faculty in that program have the resources they need in geology, in our Williams Mystic program, to continue to educate students uh, in, in the... Um, world they're going into and how to make change in that world. Uh, and that, of course, is our core mission and is always going to be the most important part. But there are other really important parts to the plan. The second is really focused on our own emissions, actually, and the campus itself, um, and how to make the campus more sustainable over time. We've had important investments in that already uh, in a collaborative project, solar project, with several other institutions that is now generating all of the college's electricity, or mo almost all of the college's electricity. Um, and uh, uh, we are doing the hard work right now of thinking about what it would mean to move away from our central heating plant as our source of energy. Uh, heat and hot water. Um, I can tell you that that is um, no small investment, so uh, we're only at the beginning of studying what it would mean to potentially go to geothermal or some other now newly being invented form of, uh, of solving this problem. And it's a major investment, both financially and infrastructure-wise, um, that would have to happen in many over many years. Uh, we are going to do that work, but we're just at the beginning stages of figuring out what that's going to look like. Um, but we're also thinking about other ways of meeting our sustainability goals. We've had a big focus on campus travel this year, um, in part because we saw what the impact of the pandemic was on immediately um, helping us reach our sustainability goals simply, just simply, by nobody going anywhere. Um, that just cut our travel emissions like that. <laughs> um, now, of course, we don't want that. We want to go places, our athletic teams, our admissions officers. We want you to come to us. We, our scholars need to go to archives and to conferences and uh, to go do research. So we're not going to stop traveling. But we are trying to do work on campus to really elevate the significance of the question of why do you travel? Do you need to travel? What is? Are you taking the most? sustainable journey um, and it and it sounds like small bore um, and it's small bore in part because again going back to what is the most important impact that Williams can have it is on educating students that is our most important resource that we can invest in in terms of this question going forward but we also want to model what it takes to live sustainably and we're not we're not there yet we have so much work to do uh, in this space and so we want to and this goes back to that relay race metaphor what are the next things that we can continue to do not only to help get there but to show how complicated it is actually and how much people have to change behavior and their own practices um, and what a struggle that can be and bring students into that conversation because that's really the powerful thing we can do here right is to say 
you know, we move to all combustible, com compostable, excuse me, not combustible, compostable, so it's too much talking in one day, compostable um, uh, uh, to-go containers, right, so that, and then students throw them in the garbage along with the metal forks, <laughs> right? And so, so, right, how are you, how do you educate and continue to involve the community in those conversations? So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and let's say thanks to Mog. Felt like a great Williams class being here with all of you. Good questions, captivating professor, you know, for, for a solid hour. And so, so grateful to Maude for you, for your time, for all that you do for Williams. I think that Thanks, goes Kate. without saying. Um, this is a small token of appreciation from the class of 1997, <laughs> celebrating. Thank you. Um, and as Maude continues to accrue purple clothing, she can now wear our shirt in the parade tomorrow, if she so chooses. Um, so thank you. Now I'm really all purple. All purple, inside and out. So uh, thanks to all of you for being here today, and I hope we see you around campus and get to connect.